So with that, um, I ask you to give your uh, full attention and help me to welcome Lord Freud. Thank you very much. Uh, lovely to see you all today. I'm sorry it's quite so early. I have to be back in London because we're voting on matters of marriage. So um, uh, I know you all have deep views on that. Um, but let me uh, straight to the point here uh, um, about what's happening with occupational health, which is uh, oddly the changes that we've been seeing in recent years are running parallel with what is happening uh, with the, the whole of the welfare system, which is, which is seeing a, a huge amount of reform. And underlying all of that reform is really the basic concept uh, that work is good for people. Uh, it's not something to protect people from. It's exactly the opposite. And that's, dr that's really what's one of the underlying principles of the centerpiece of our reform program, which is universal credit. Um, and clearly, uh, the parallel element to that is the new, somewhat awkwardly named Health and Work Assessment and Advice Service. I'm going to have a raffle at the end to anyone who can get a better title. Um, but that clearly is um, something that is aimed to allow more people to stay in the workforce uh, so we don't get the problem of people falling out in the first place. I'll come back to it. Um, I think one of the key moments for the ref reform of welfare and, and, and the new direction we're in is the document that came out in uh, 2006 by Waddle and Burton, which basically took all of the research uh, and asked the question, um, is work good for your health? And the answer that came back in that document was an unequivocal uh, yes. And, and, that, um, and that answer had a profound effect on government thinking. Actually, both of the last government and, and clearly this government, I, I, as probably some of you will know, I've been involved in both of them, so I can see the, the history. Um, I mean, it, it, it basically, this document shone a light on an issue that uh, people have been trying to grapple with for years um, um, because if we had a, a state system that is trying to help people by keeping them out of work if they were a little bit ill, um, that was exactly the wrong way round when actually that kind of, um, that kind of approach was like to be, uh, do, do people actual harm uh, rather than do them good. It simply does no, doesn't do anyone any favours at all to, to, to sign them off on, on, on the long-term sick. Um, so uh, far from um, 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 having a strategy to protect people who were less than 100% uh, fit from the rigours of the workplace, this research really just stood that whole thinking on its head. Work had to become the desirable state. Uh, and that the central presumption has to be, had to be, that, um, 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 w that work um, uh, should be the uh, d desirable state unless there were really, really good reasons to the contrary. And we should aim to get people to remain in work where they possibly could and get back to work as soon as they are able to do it. And clearly, uh, the old welfare system <coughs> was driving in almost the opposite direction. Um, uh, nowhere was it more stuck in the past than in its approach to disability uh, and sickness. Uh, and that is why we are now seeing uh, this major transformation uh, in, in, in the approach from government um, and indeed in, in the approach from society more widely uh, in, in how we look at uh, health and work in relation health and sickness in relation to the workplace. Um, we've already done a lot of things, so uh, the, de the department, DWP, has already moved towards much more individualized work programs, uh, which offer uh, intensive support in a more flexible way. Uh, we focused on getting lone parents back to work much earlier than, uh, that, than was the case in the past. We've increased the expectations on the people who've been uh, on uh, incapacity benefit, around two and a half million people, um, who 
basically until then had been left uh, to fend for themselves. Um, the other thing that we're doing is introduce. Actually, we already have we have already introduced um, uh, the uh, one single working age benefit, the universal credit, which um, simplifies what's been a complex web of different payments uh, to people uh, from the benefit system. Uh, that in many cases, in too many cases, has actually acted as a disincentive to work. Uh, so. That system, universal credit, really builds on the, on the expectation uh, that work is at the, the heart of what we want people to be doing. The, what, one of the um, central elements of this approach um, c comes from the groundbreaking work of um, a man called Aaron Antonovsky, uh, which, uh, I I interesting, championed in this country, in the whole country, by the... Um, Chief Medical Officer of Scotland, Sir Harry Burns, uh, who has really done an enormous amount to put that thinking at the heart of our approach. What Antonovsky argued was that a purpose in life, he called it coherence, was crucial to understanding uh, human health and well-being. Um, so we all get uh, things going wrong for us every day, whether it's, you know, the taxi being on time, whether, you know, um, you're burgled, all the, you know, you have a little crash with your, all those things happening to everyone all the time, some big things. Um, and whether they overwhelm us or not uh, is, according to Antonovsky, um, uh, based on whether our, our, our sense of coherence is undermined and violated. Uh, so if people know why things are happening to them, um, if they have support <coughs> and the ability to manage their affairs, they have a good chance of maintaining their well-being and indeed in maintaining their health. Uh, and it, actually, that's almost reason enough on its own to justify the introduction of universal credit because that is a much simpler system which will give people an insight uh, into what the state is doing for them. Uh, and more importantly, it, it will allow them to understand if they change their behaviors, how the state system will change with them. At the moment, that is <coughs> bluntly very, very difficult to do. No part of the benefit system is more illuminated by Antonovsky's theory uh, than how we deal with illness. What he said was, we are coming to understand health not, not as the absence of disease, but rather as the process by which individuals maintain their sense of coherence to allow them the resilience needed to thrive. So the longer someone is out of work, the less likely their life is to have an overarching sense of purpose or meaning. Uh, and the less help that people receive at vulnerable, vulnerable moments, the more likely they are to fall through the cracks. And so, actually, when you start to think about well-being and health in those terms, uh, the DWP suddenly becomes almost as relevant to people's health, uh, or long-term well-being, at least, as, as, as the Department of Health. Um, but if that's the case, we have a really big problem. Um, DWP has always focused on how to get people into work um, and clearly there's been a lot of changes, the, uh, the, the new employment and support allowances goes a lot, lot further in supporting people uh, than the old uh, IB system. Um, but there is a, a black hole in the system uh, in the way that, that it intervenes between the workplace and the state benefit system. Um, how do we help those who fall ill at work? Um, because bluntly, we do virtually nothing for them in what is a 28-week period before they become entitled uh, to move on to the state system. Uh, so the question is, can we get support to people uh, in work uh, uh, in that 28-week period um, uh, to help them get back to work sooner. Uh, large numbers involved, there's around 300,000 people who fall out of the system every year. 
Uh, and there's a, clearly a big human cost to that, and there's actually a big uh, financial cost, not to talk of the wasted resources. So if you look at the monetary terms, uh, the monetary figures, um, health-related unemployment benefits cost the taxpayer 13 billion last year. Employers spent 9 billion on sick pay and associated costs, and overall working age, ill health costs the whole economy uh, what's estimated to be 100 billion pounds a year. Clearly, there are some great examples uh, in the workplace about uh, the, the, the programs that really do, uh, that are effective. I'm thinking, uh, for instance, of uh, BT's WorkFit Positive Mentality Program, uh, where um, uh, they aim to help people look after their mental health, and the figures back it up. They've, they've, they've got their absence rates uh, falling um, due, due to mental health falling by um, a third over four years. And uh, the large employers, uh, many of them, do offer uh, their employees access to occupational health service, and, that, and that's the case for 80% of large employers. But it's not the case, for instance, for the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, where the figure is a shocking a contrast to that 80%, it is only 11% uh, give their employees a chance to, to, to get the kind of support they need. Um, there's also a problem with, um, with, with, with GPs or um, with GPs in their role uh, as the main guardians of the fit note. Um, clearly, um, it, it's now the case uh, it wasn't the case that long ago, but it is now the case that most GPs think that work is good for, for their patients' health, um, but they can still be pretty reluctant uh, to translate that into challenging their own patients' assumptions about, uh, about their fitness for work. Uh, uh, and there's some very good reasons for that. Uh, it, it's, um, they don't want to undermine uh, uh, the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, and there's also a, 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 another question. That this is quite difficult stuff. I'm, I'm telling an audience that I know will agree with that statement. Um, it, it's, um, it, there's some real specialist knowledge uh, involved here that, <coughs> that the general GP um, um, will often, probably usually, not have. Um, so what's the solution? Um, it was clear that uh, employers uh, and the health profession had a big stake in any answer to the, to the, to the problem. And so uh, we looked uh, for, for two people in those areas who could help us with some advice. And that's why we asked uh, Dane Carroll Black, who was then the National Director for Health and Work, and uh, David Frost, who was then the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, uh, to come up with some views. They came up with a report, I'm sure many of you will have read it, uh, I'm sure all of you will have glanced at it, uh, called Health at Work, um, which was an independent <laughs> review of the sickness absence. And it came out with uh, a lot of important recommendations, um, um, clearly to improve the support for GPs and their understanding of the benefit system was one basic level, um, increase the incentives uh, on em employers to manage their staff sickness effectively uh, and to uh, simplify the administrative burden. But I think the most central recommendations, the biggest recommendation, the most important and the most relevant recommendation for, 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 uh, for, for the audience today, for you today, is the creation uh, of this um, awkwardly named uh, health assessment uh, uh, um, and, and, uh, and advice service. Um, we, we've been working with the experts on this, uh, and indeed Sir Harry Burns uh, is, is the chairman of, of our little expert uh, council, uh, to, to design a real first here, uh, uh, which is a national service uh, providing an in-depth assessment of how a pay employee's health is affecting their ability to work, and advice on how people on sick leave can be supported back to work. So uh, the timing that we thought was the best uh, was that we would have that piece of advice um, um, at the four-week point. Uh, when you look at the data, you see a big 
drop off at that point. Um, and you can really see there's not much difference in terms of prognosis as some, but not a huge amount between looking at someone at the four-week point and then right out in the 20, 28-week point. So intervening then uh, was the time. And then we're looking at signposting uh, to the right interve interventions and case managements uh, for the more complex cases. Um, and uh, we've also um, just announced in the last uh, budget uh, that we're introducing a tax relief for employers uh, for those health-related interventions which are recommended by the service. So rather than costing an employer uh, £140, which is the current situation, uh, £100 of support will cost the employer £100. Um, so um, uh, um, uh, the early timing um, is, um, is, is, is absolutely uh, vital. And uh, I think one other aspect of this that is going to be pretty hard to craft is that so many of the people who want sick notes actually don't have a medical problem or not a primary medical problem. They've got a social problem at work. And getting a service that gets that balance right, uh, uh, which is really intermediation back uh, with the workplace is going to be quite a substantial uh, part of the job. So we, we mustn't look at it as a pure health, a series of health interventions. It's a much bigger uh, and more complicated uh, position than that. Um, so anyway, so I think this is really, actually really exciting because uh, it really, w what we're doing is plugging a gap that has been uh, in existence basically since, um, since the days of beverage. Um, um, clearly, before the National Health Service was invented, work was a dangerous place to be in many cases, um, and industrial occupational medicine was about keeping people, uh, 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 pre preventing work related disease, and that often meant remo removing from the place of work. Um, so um, when the uh, National Health Service was introduced, uh, this, the state structures for dealing with the health of the nation were introduced, but occupational health remained a, a Cinderella service. Um, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's that status, a branch apart, that is actually never really <coughs> caught up that ground of getting at the centre. So the new assessment and advice service um, uh, is really an opportunity to bring occupational health right back into the mainstream where it belongs um, uh, in the heart of an integrated system. And it's the chance for GPs, for employers, employees, and occupational health professionals to work together to improve uh, the health of the nation, in particular to make sure that we catch problems before they really start getting serious. Um, so I do have really high hopes that this is going to improve the overall health of the nation. Um, clearly, uh, there will be some... Uh, there'll be real personal benefits from that. There'll be some economic benefits from that. Um, and clearly, it will put occupational health back at the, uh, at the front line. And I, and I think some of the implications of that, we're going to start seeing more interests uh, from uh, the young medics looking to where to specialize. Um, it's going to encourage more training and professional development. Um, and... Um, and there'll be lots of links, as I said, into the mainstream. Um, so um, work ticks a lot of the Antonovsky bo boxes, whether it's financial independence, whether it's a um, uh, sense of satisfaction, all of those things. Um, but as the population grows older, the working population grows older, and I think we saw the, uh, the number of people who we're past the retirement age now in the workplace has just ticked over the million mark. Uh, clearly, there's an increasing need to make use of our most productive people, uh, and employers are going to rely um, more uh, on older people, um, on their skill and experience. And it's more difficult for those over 50 to return to work once they're out of work. Um, so. Uh, getting the support in to employees at the onset of their problems is going to become 
uh, more important than it's ever been for that reason. Real benefits for us in spending modest amounts of money to catch problems quickly uh, to help people stay working, stay healthier, uh, and enjoy the benefits of an active contribution. And I just want to finish off today with one of the things that I have been um, found more problematic than virtually anything else, and that is um, how to help people, support people uh, with mental health problems. Um, huge numbers here. Um, uh, at any one time, uh, you know, the, 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 um, um, the view is there's, there's one in six people wrestling with some kind of mental problem, whether it's, it's often <coughs> mild or moderate, you know, whether it's depression, anxiety, and so forth. Um, takes a huge toll later on when we look at our ESA statistics, the figures around 44% of them, their primary reason for being on the, uh, on the support is mental health. Um, costs are large, uh, meant to be, uh, on the estimates, around £40 billion a year. But it's quite hidden. Um, uh, people don't like to talk about it. Um, there's stigma. Uh, there's a, still a lack of understanding. Um, and um, uh, the, we don't really know, actually, what's, uh, what helps, what works. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons that we don't understand this is because this revolution I've been describing, that work, putting work back in the center uh, as a solution, not as a problem, uh, is something that's very recent. And we haven't really understood how it applies uh, to mental health. So I'm very keen to, um, to get a better understanding of this. And we've commissioned. That's Norman Lamb and myself, and Norman Lamb is Minister for Care and Support. So we've commissioned some advice how we can align um, our health services and our employment services for people uh, with mental health problems. Um, so the areas that we're going to explore is, uh, you know, when does a mental health problem warrant a specific intervention by an employment service? Uh, how can this be identified in an employment service without over-medicalizing uh, the discussions unduly? Um, and then how can we achieve both employment-focused health services and health-aware employment services in those two areas? So those are the questions. Uh, I, I think that's, um, that, that is going to be a very important development, and it builds on uh, the developments that I've already been talking about. We couldn't really be going in this direction and trying to tackle, I think, which is the last frontier of our serious problems in this area. Couldn't do that unless we built on, on, on the other things that we have uh, now designed. Uh, okay, so that's a, a quick fl flip through, and now I know you're going to have a 101 questions. So I'd be delighted to have. Thank you very much for that.